So hi everyone and welcome to the webinar this afternoon on tips and tools for supporting disabled people in work, training and education. My name is Annie Mannion, I'm Digital Communications Manager at AbilityNet and I'll be introducing today's webinar and running you through what you can expect from today's session. Um, I'm joined today by Rabia Lemayu, uh, who is a um, Disability and Skills Manager at Disability Rights UK and Adam Tweed, who is Service Development Manager at AbilityNet. Uh, Adam is going to be um, hosting the slide deck today, so Adam, if you could, yeah, great, you put up the first slide, thank you. Um, so just to go through a few bits of housekeeping before we start the content for today's session. Um, we've, we do have live captions on the webinar provided by My Clear Text. So it's a live person running that, so we appreciate My Clear Text support. Uh, slides and a transcript are available, so if you do have any technical issues and you need to leave early, don't worry, there will be an automatic email sharing the recording and slides. Um, the slide deck is also available on our website um, now, so uh, we're just going to put the link for that in the chat box. Um, and depending on how you joined the webinar, um, you should be able to access the chat window or the, in the Q&A window. Please, um, please just use the chat window in the main for queries or comments for us to address. And then we'll use the Q&A option um, to ask the questions to the panelists at the end. So if you, if you want to ask Rabia or Adam any direct questions, do drop those in the Q&A section for us to address later on. Um, we do also have a feedback page that you'll be directed to at the end, which invites you to tell us about any future topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars. So um, if there's anything you'd like us to speak about, please do use that opportunity. Okay, and um, next slide please, Adam. So just before we get stuck into the actual content of the webinar, here's a quick overview of what we'll be covering. We'll be looking at the benefits of employing a, a diverse and inclusive workforce, uh, advice for helping disabled people find paid employment and apprenticeships, adjustments to better support people with additional needs, and then we'll be looking at some tools, apps, and inbuilt features that can make a difference. So can I just check, um, can everybody um, see and access the slides on screen? If not, please do raise your hand or let us know via the chat pane. Uh, my colleague Mark Gaddis will be helping to answer any queries that we've got coming through. Still just wait to see if there are any, any comments. No, great, okay. So, we're just going to um, introduce the first poll just to find out a bit more about you all, um, your levels of involvement in the topic and to just gauge who we've got joining and your reasons for attending. So I'm just going to launch the first poll now. So um, for those who can't actually see the screen, I'm just going to read out um, the question which is, how would you describe yourself or your reason for attending today's webinar? Are you an HR professional, careers advisor? Perhaps you work with disabled young adults or students? Um, perhaps you're a diversity or inclusion professional and a disabled job seeker looking for advice about support um, or a relative or a friend or um, anybody else who's joining us. So please note that in the chat pane. Um, depending on how you've joined the webinar, you may find you can't see the poll, but you can respond in the chat pane. Okay, I'm just going to give everybody a bit more of a chance to answer. You can see the results coming through now. Okay, I'm going to end the poll in just a couple more seconds. So please do add your vote if you'd like. Okay. So I'm just going to share the results with you now. Okay, so um, I hope you can all see the results. We've got mainly um, professionals working with um, disabled young adults or students and um, some other roles as well, the HR professionals, careers advisors, so quite a broad spectrum um, of people joining us. So I'll just stop sharing the results now and I'll hand over to Rabia for 
the first part of today's webinar. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Annie. Uh, can I have the, the next slide? Hi, so we are Disability Rights UK and uh, we are disabled people leading change. We are a, a national charity. Our strategic priorities are independent living, career opportunities, people for getting into work and education and influencing public attitudes and behavior. Uh, we work for equal participation for all, and the majority of trustees, staff, and volunteers have lived experience of disability or health conditions. Yes? Nick? We provide information and advice designed by and for disabled people and people living with long-term health conditions. Uh, we have fact sheets and guides on our website, and we have a disabled student helpline. Uh, we run several projects, and we also uh, have Twitter news. Okay. Just a few key facts to sort of like uh, paint the picture. There are 13.9 million disabled people in the UK, 16 to 18 uh, to 19% of working age adults are disabled. Uh, and the unemployment rate for disabled people aged 16 64 is 8% compared to an unemployment rate of 3.3% for non-disabled people. And the economic inactivity for disabled people is 45.9% uh, uh, in comparison to non-disabled people, which is 16.2. Young disabled people aged 16 to 24 are more likely than other groups to end up not in employment, education or training need. And gaining experience of the workplace and with employers particularly present additional barriers for young disabled people and therefore the support that they receive in the workplace and, and during training is really important for them. Okay. Just a few words about some of the barriers that people have um, when they uh, are thinking about uh, employing or having somebody for training uh, who has declared that they have a disability. Uh, a lot of the fear is around using incorrect terminology or language, asking questions not permitted under the Equality uh, Act 2010, and when to offer help. There are also concerns that people have. Um, they think somebody may not be able to do the job. Uh, can they integrate with the team? And are they allowed to treat somebody more favorable than others? Or is that what uh, other people will see that they are doing? Okay. As an organization uh, or a company, you can take positive action. You can treat a disabled person more favorable than a non-disabled person so that they are not put at a disadvantage. Where an organization is taking positive action to encourage people with a particular disability, for example, is an employer is aware that people with learning disabilities have a particularly high rate of unemployment. So they set up a mentoring and job shadowing program for people with learning disabilities to help them prepare to apply for jobs. You can also treat a disabled person more favorably than another disabled person uh, when it is essential for the job. So an organization supporting deaf people might require that an employee whose role is providing counseling to British Sign Language users is a deaf BSL user, and that's occupational requirement. And you can get more uh, information on that on the Equality Human Rights uh, website, which I've put on there for you. So under the Equality Act 2010, employers and organizations have a responsibility to make sure that disabled people can access jobs, education and services as easily as non-disabled people. So that's known as a duty to make reasonable adjustments. And for, to have a change to employ or train more disabled young people, we really need to have a change in attitudes and culture. And we need to shift our way of thinking and to look at the strengths and skills that disabled people bring to the workplace. So for example, somebody who is neurodiverse 
may have very good analytical skills or somebody may have really good attention to detail. When I was speaking with some of our uh, deaf clients, they would say, well, we, re we really have good concentration skills because we are not distracted. Um, maybe somebody may be good at solving problems as they may be doing on a daily basis because of an impairment or health conditions. And all these are highly valued characteristics and skills employers are looking for. So it's shifting uh, the focus on away from the disability, but on the ability and the strengths that disabled people can bring to the workplace. So disability as an asset. Reasons why you should want to hire a disabled person is that it may have a particular advantages. People may use uh, the way that they look at things differently or more creatively. And diversities of views is an asset and it broadens the knowledge of uh, the customers. Disabled people will bring different life experiences and perspectives uh, to the workplace. Um, and employees who feel then valued, supported, encouraged and treated well are likely to be better engaged, more loyal, harder working and less likely to take time off sick. So it's about finding the best talent that is out there and looking at all these strengths and skills that people can, can uh, bring to the workplace. Yes. So employing disabled people is good for business because you will have a workforce that reflects the diverse range of customers it serves in the community and it will bring additional skills to the business. And something that uh, we're hearing quite a lot now is uh, employers are saying that diversity drives success. Yes. Now, there are mi common misconceptions about reasonable adjustments that people will say it's expensive, employers must pay for all the adjustments, but there are adjustments that can easily be done or cost very little. And I think Adam is going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, it is often a fear that stops us from asking or engaging uh, with a disabled person, but everybody is unique. So it's best to ask the disabled people what support that they want because they will know this. And to take time to ask people that you're engaging with what works best for them and to revisit that throughout their period of training or work. To find out what support is available uh, when moving on to training, learning, so that they feel confident about what they want to do. And Another thing that people have said that, you know, we like to see more role models. We want to see a holistic approach to provide a continuity of support. Sometimes support is only at the beginning, but for some people, it would have to be available throughout the duration of employment or training and to support plans regularly and revisit uh, the needs because for people with health conditions, this may shift or change. Uh, over the months or years that they work. Okay. Flexibility is something that people uh, uh, talk about a lot, you know, the work arrangements, the starting time, the finishing time, you know, is nine o'clock, does a person have to be at work necessarily at nine o'clock if they find it difficult uh, to use public transport, uh, when it is very busy during the rush hour, can they come in a little bit later? Can they leave a little bit later or earlier? Can they work from home? Um, to sort of have that discussion with, with uh, the employer, with, with uh, the employee. The breakdown of new tasks and skills is very important um, th that to go through that. Maybe give a demonstration rather than just talk to the person, particularly if it's a, a young, a young uh, apprentice who comes, you know, to sort of like really demonstrate how they can do that. Um, for some people, it might be providing a quiet space uh, and then assistive technology, uh, another big uh, um, issue that uh, Adam will talk more about. Okay. I'm gonna say a few words about apprenticeship and the support that is available. 
uh, apprentices who have an education health and care plan or previously had a statement of special educational needs or a learning difficulty assessment can apply for an adjustment to English and maths requirements to entry level three functional skills. And British Sign Language can now be used as an alternative to English functional skills for those who have BSL as their first language. And that came about uh, through the main art recommendations, which was excellent news. Okay. And there is some extra funding uh, available as well uh, for apprentices aged 16 to 18 or 19 to 24 who have an education health and care plan. Uh, the, uh, the, there is a payment of a thousand pounds available for both the employer and the training provider. And training providers can also claim learning support up to 150 pounds a month from the Education and Skills Funding Agency. And there is a new uh, bursary as well for care leavers, care leavers uh, of a thousand pounds available um, aged 16 to 24 when they start a new apprenticeship. And that is money that goes directly uh, to them. Also a, a word on access to work. An access to work grant can pay for uh, practical support if you have a disability, physical or mental health condition to help you with starting your work, staying in work, and to move into self-employment or start a business. Yeah. And access to work does cover apprenticeships, traineeships, and supported internships. And it will help towards the additional cost, for example, of a taxi fare, if you have difficulties using public transport to get to work. It could be a support worker, such as a reader or somebody with a visual impairment, a communicator. It could be a specialist job coach for a person with learning difficulty or a help for personal care needs during work, specialist equipment or, or alternations to existing equipment to suit your particular needs. The principles of access to work is that they will pay above and beyond a reasonable adjustment that the employer have to make. So support that complements but does not replace or subsidize an employer's legal duty to make reasonable adjustments. It's that additional uh, cost that they will cover. And uh, it is for the support that allows individuals to overcome workplace barriers that arise from their disability. And there is a lot of information on that on the government website www.gov.uk apprenticeships or um, access to work if you want to have more information on that. So Another thing is that it has to be value for money. So it needs to support uh, the individual's needs in the most cost effective way for the taxpayer. There is another um, support that is available through access to work and that's through Remploy. And Remploy provides a, a free service for apprentices who are feeling low, anxious, upset and struggling to keep up with their apprenticeship. It's completely confidential and it is run by fully trained professionals with expertise in mental health. And again, you know, get, you can get further information on that on the government website. The one thing I would say is that with access to work, if things don't go too smoothly and people need a little bit more time to fill in their forms and with the assessment, uh, to keep in touch with access to work, you know, to keep those communication um, channels to open because otherwise a case may be closed and then you'll have to start again. So that is a possibility because the time is often that, that they are giving may not be enough for certain people to do that. Okay. Uh, for those who are interested uh, of doing an apprenticeship, we have an apprenticeship guide uh, that you can download free from the internet, but lots of information. Uh, disabled young people who want to go into apprenticeships and the different uh, routes they can take and the support that is available to them. Yeah. We also have uh, a right to participate. Uh, it's uh, an introduction to the Equality Act. We have videos and campaigns and a template complaint letter to protect disabled people from discrimination in everyday situations, which will explain the different stages a person has to go through first if they are, want to make a complaint 
uh, in either work or uh, in, in the society or with education. Yes. And if you have uh, any other questions, uh, you can contact uh, Disability Rights UK on the website or you can email me rabia.lemayeu at disabilityrightsuk.org. And if there are any more questions, then um, you can ask later on or email me. Thank you, Rabia. That was really interesting. You know there's a real need to see the employment and apprenticeship rates for disabled people going up. So hopefully um, that will happen after your advice today. And um, employers here today have some good tips to take away. Um, so for anyone who joined a bit later, um, there'll be a chance to ask, ask um, questions at the end to both Rabia and Adam. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to Adam Tweed from AbilityNet. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me right? Perfect. Um, so uh, thank you and thank you everybody for, for choosing to spend your, your lunch hour with us. I am Adam Tweed. I'm the Service Development Manager for AbilityNet. Um, answers on a postcard if you could tell me exactly what that job title means, but uh, I'm going with it at the moment. Um, and I'm talking to you about the tools, apps and inbuilt features that can make a difference when you're applying for jobs and in positions. So AbilityNet supports people of any age living <coughs> excuse me, living with any disability or impairment to use technology to achieve their goals at home, at work and in education. And we do this by providing specialist advice services, free information resources and by helping to build a more uh, accessible digital world. We have advice. Um, so we have advice available on our website. We have fact sheets and we also publish regular blogs that I'm hoping a lot of you will have seen. Um, we also have a free helpline, that's 0800 269 545. Um, and there you can chat to somebody if you have any um, queries about technology and using technology for yourself or people you're supporting. Um, for the purpose of this um, webinar, uh, one of our key services we provide is workplace assessments. So we um, carry out needs assessments within the workplace. Um, and we also have accessibility testing of websites. So we have a, a very dedicated team who will um, look at your websites and check them for accessibility so that they can be used obviously by everybody. Um, I want to start by quickly covering the concept of unconscious bias. So unconscious bias is something that we all experience. We, extinct, we instinctively categorize people and things using criteria we can easily observe. So that's age, gender, skin color, disability. And it saves us time and effort when it comes to processing the huge amounts of information we're bombarded with every day. But it does lead us to make assumptions and act based on those assumptions um, and biases. So when we think about and talk about disability in the workplace, it's perhaps not surprising that our un unconscious bias triggers around 50% of us to think of people in wheelchairs. It's disability in perhaps its most obvious form. And yet less than 8% of disabilities require the use of a wheelchair. I mention this because I think when it comes to employing disabled people, one of the biggest barriers is the perceived scale that accommodating disability suggests and physical access seems to be where our brains just reach this block. Um, in a survey by Reed, um, in partnership with uh, Disability Rights UK, 19% of respondents stated that they considered the cost of modifying equipment made it expensive to employ disabled people. The truth of the matter is it's simply not the case. And the accommodations required to bring disabled people into the workplace, so-called reasonable adjustments, are far less difficult to achieve than our unconscious bias may suggest. So, Purple, <coughs> excuse me, an organisation focused on bringing disabled people and businesses together, has suggested that the average cost of reasonable adjustments is around 180 pounds per person. And often this can be supplemented by schemes such as the access to work that Rabia has just mentioned, um, which provides additional assistance when the barriers remain after reasonable adjustments have been made. However, 
According to the US Job Accommodation Network, 59% of common adjustments cost nothing to the employer. And as I highlight later, figures from the tools that we use suggest up to 90% of the adjustments can be done at very little cost and can be achieved by line management intervention alone. The key point that I want to make is that if you build inclusive practices, it no longer becomes a question of accommodating a disabled person. Inclusive environments require minimal adjustments to gain the maximum from everyone. And as our web accessibility team states, it's not about accessibility, it's about universality. But why? I mean, as recruiters, HR professionals, business people and job seekers, you all know that inclusion and diversity are things we should legally do. But at some point, you're gonna come across somebody asking the question, what's in it for me? Why should I make this investment? And I'll touch on just a few points and the points that Rabia has also covered, but we really do want to kind of hammer them home. So there's a misconception. And again, this goes back to unconscious or maybe even conscious bias that disabled people require more time off for, signet, for sickness. It's a view held by about 12% of the respondents in the Reed DRUK survey. In fact, the opposite is true. And the fact that disabled workers have often had to overcome significant barriers in order to enter the workforce often means a much stronger work ethic and job loyalty. An inclusive culture also attracts people to a company with almost 50% of job applicants stating that a diversity and inclusion policy is a key thing that they look for when deciding to apply for a job. Disability drives innovation. Innovation is all about fixing the barriers that we face, making things better, faster, easier to use, and to grossly um, overgeneralize disabled people as a result of the barriers they face often have to be innovative problem solvers. They have to find ways around problems to think outside the box, to negotiate, to be resourceful, tenacious and persistent. And as again, as Rabia said, these are all qualities it's ridiculous to ignore as a potential employer. In addition to this, a 2013 report by Deloitte found that when employees think their organization is committed to and supportive of diversity and they feel included, their ability to innovate increases by 83%. Now, quite how they measure that metric, I, I really don't know, but uh, the point is there is an increase in that. And you only need to look at the series of scandals in Silicon Valley, for example, to see what happens when decisions are made by a group of people who look, act, and think the same way. They come from similar backgrounds and have similar life experiences, and the products of the decisions that they make seem to target that very narrow group, and then the trouble starts. <coughs> Being an inclusive organization can provide public, can improve rather public perception. Being an inclusive employer, an employer that values a diverse workforce, will benefit from this public perception and will typically lead to an increased uptake in services. So-called purple pound um, is valued at around 250 billion pounds a year. Conversely, 4.3 million disabled online shoppers will click away from inaccessible websites at a loss of 11.75 billion. And an estimated 75% of disabled people and their families have gone elsewhere in physical shops due to poor accessibility or customer service. Now, if you employ disabled people, you're gonna very quickly find out where your barriers lie. And I'm just gonna hand over now to Annie for another poll. Thanks, Adam. I'm just going to launch the poll now. So um, uh, just depending on how you've joined the webinar, you may find you can't see the poll, but you can respond to the question in the chat panel. So the question is, do you work with anyone with a disability? Uh, yes, no, or don't know. Um, so I'm just going to let the poll run for a bit longer um, for anybody who wants to engage with us. You can see the votes going up. Okay, last few seconds for everybody to engage with the poll. Okay, I'm just going to end the poll now.
and um, oh, and share the results. So perhaps unsurprisingly, um, given the results of the previous poll, um, which showed that many of you who are attending um, work with young adults or students who are disabled, um, it's overwhelmingly yes. Um, uh, Eighty-seven percent of you do work with people with a disability, um, and then uh, nine percent of you are not sure. Um, so I don't know, Adam, if you have um, any comments to make about that. So I'm just going to stop sharing the poll now and hand back to Adam. Yep, yeah, I mean that's really interesting. I think um, obviously, given the the audience, um, not unsurprising. But the not sure is is a really interesting. Um, and a really interesting result because leading into my next slide, um, the thing to bear in mind when we think about the unconscious biases I was talking about earlier is that not every disability is physical or visible. 70% are non-apparent. These might be things like diabetes or epilepsy, but how would you know, for example, if somebody is deaf, if you are just looking at them across the room? Not every disability is disclosed. So one in four of us experience a mental health condition every year. And 36% of mental health conditions remain undiagnosed. Not every disability is recognized. Between one in 10 and one in seven people are neurodiverse. It's another thing that Rabia brought up earlier. So this is dyslexia at around one in 10. Um, dyspraxia, one in 20. ADHD, one in 25 and one in a hundred uh, people is on the autism spectrum. Although the, autism, the uh, employment rates for people on the spectrum are very low in most industries. And these are typically due to the barriers in the hiring practices and the workplace attitudes that are in place at the moment that we're trying to break. And not all disability is present from birth. So eight out of 10 of us will acquire some level of impairment during our working life. We also need to consider the fact that not every disability is permanent. Um, all of us experience some level of disability pretty much on a daily basis. And I like this graphic, I've pinched it from Microsoft, so I apologize for that uh, to them. But um, this just demonstrates how in each of these areas, um, there are uh, both the, um, so the first uh, in the list of, of disabilities here or impairments here is a permanent a permanent impairment. So you've got one arm, deaf, blind or nonverbal. The next one along is a temporary um, impairment. So things like injuries, infections. And then the third one in the line is a situational impairment. So something like not being able to use your arms because you're holding a, a baby or you're in a crowded room so you can't hear. So Designing your products, your policies, your working practices um, with inclusion at the core has the added benefit of assisting everyone and having adjustments in place that mean that, uh, that acquiring a disability does not risk losing a skilled employee either temporarily or permanently. So we know it's not necessarily expensive. We can see the benefits. So what's available for you to bake it into your practice? So, <clears throat> excuse me, the Reed um, Disability Rights UK survey I mentioned earlier highlighted that almost half, so that's 47% of respondents said it would be, it would help if job applicants were more willing to be open about their health conditions, as this would allow the organisation to take appropriate measures at interview and assessment stage. But obviously we've covered unconscious bias and we hear time and time again of people who are um, unwilling to disclose a level of disability for fear of being discriminated against. So clear talents is, in, is a tool that we use. There are kind of three flavors. So clear talents in recruitment, as its name suggests, assists with the recruitment process and ensures that you find the right person for the job by eliminating the risk of unconscious balance, of unconscious bias. Rather. So it integrates with your recruitment process and it allows your applicants to apply for a job 
disclose levels of um, disclose barriers rather than specific impairments and allows you to set up the adjustments that they will need in order to access the interview process and also the adjustments that are needed within the workplace. Clear Talents on Demand is available for everybody for free and allows you to identify the barriers in the workplace and offer some simple solutions and information with regards to addressing this. Clear Talent at Work gives you access to the metrics and the case management, allowing you as an organization, if you um, choose to set this up, um, to gain an insight into your overall workforce and to target the areas in which you can see the best benefit and the best return. So the companies that have used Clear Talents have seen disclosure rates go from 5% to 65% in the same year at the same time as seeing sickness absence drop uh, by nearly 50% and that's in a single year. The other, th the other key thing that is highlighted is the fact that 90% of the adjustments required could be resolved directly with line management at little to no cost. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. And we've now got uh, another poll, so I'm just gonna quickly hand back to Annie. Okay, I'm just going to launch the poll now. Um, and the question is, do you check your communications and documents for accessibility? So answer yes, no, or don't know. Um, and again, for anybody who has joined the webinar later on, um, depending on how you've joined the webinar, you may find you can't see the poll. So please do um, respond in the chat panel instead. So I'm just going to let the poll run a bit longer to give you a chance to vote. Numbers just going up a little bit. Okay, just a few more seconds and then I'm going to end the poll. Okay. And I'm going to share the results with you now. And um, uh, yes, you do check your um, communications and documents for accessibility. That's really positive. 68% of you. 22% um, say no and 10% um, don't know. So I'm just going to stop sharing the results now and um adam i don't know if that is um a, a typical um set of responses or it's not that's um that's an incredibly good set of responses <laughs> um it's really really good to see that that so many of you do again it's kind of a case of pre preaching to the choir a little bit in this but it's also great that those of you who said no or don't know are being that honest um, because that's that's also what we need to know that, that what we need to know this is about being able to say I don't do this and you know it's the sort of thing that we're here to help you with so oh, am I on the slide? so yes for those of you who don't know or those of you who've said no um, there is a great tool and these are the, the kind of my top tech tips um, for this. So the first thing is the accessibility checker. So making your documents more accessible using the accessibility checker. And what we really want to do is get it to the point where for those of us old enough to remember when you had to spell check a document once you'd finished, um, it's another click. Actually what we want to get to the point of is the same as we have a spell check um, at the moment where it will run by default. Um, but the uh, accessibility checker just move to here and it's a little video this is present in across all um, of the office suite um, so Outlook Word PowerPoint Excel um, and OneNote and I'll show you this video it might be that I've got some documents in the background um, that I can uh, give you a better demonstration full screen later on but we'll see how we do for time because I, I really just want to Get here. So here we've got a point where I've put in an image, click on the check accessibility button, and it's now telling me that there's no alt description. So if I just let this run to the end and then I'll talk you through what happened there. So an alt text description on an image is vital if you have any level of sight impairment and you are including an image in a document that brings meaning to that document. Um, 
it's not, you don't need to describe every single image on a document. You can have the decorative ones that, um, that don't need to be picked up by screen readers, but somebody who uses a screen reader will typically want to, and why shouldn't they, know what that image is. So Microsoft will, um, using some of its cognitive services, be able to generate a description of that image for you. It's not always accurate. I think the, the, the example I've just shown there said it's a man, oh, it was a, it was a building I think it came up with. There was another version that I did with, a, with an astronaut that um, it came up as a, a man riding a bicycle. So there is the option to edit it. But it'll also, the, the check accessibility um, will also um, check for things like putting the image in the right place so the screen reader reads the flow and certainly in things like PowerPoint presentations, it's vital. Um, so the next thing, oh, is using the inbuilt tools um, and to normalize those. So in the workplace, um, just, Try and get to know these tools as well as you can. And here's a little example of the inbuilt voice typing. So this is dictation for uh, Google and in, in Google Docs. And I'm hoping you'll be able to hear the sound, but you'll certainly, I hope, be able to see what I was trying. I'm not a pheasant plucker. I'm a pheasant plucker's son, and I'm only plucking pheasants till the pheasant plucker comes. So I thought I'd go for, for high risk on the example. Um, and as you can see, it's picked it up incredibly well and incredibly quickly. Um, so that's dictation that is available by default within Google Docs. There's also Microsoft Dictate, very, very accurate as well. Uh, Again, on the inbuilt tools, um, there are the Microsoft learning tools. Now these are a brilliant suite for anybody who struggles with reading. Um, I've also got notes running on a different tablet at the moment using the, the Microsoft reader, just because it makes them so much easier to read. Um, again, view immersive reader, and you can change the width of the screen. You can then change the color of the background. There's text spacing, syllabification, so it breaks it into syllables. Um, and then there's a focus line. And you can scroll down using that. Basically, this, this allows a document to be read by anybody in a style that is more comfortable to them. There's also a brilliant um, narrator uh, with this, so you'll get your document read out. And the point is you don't need to declare a disability in order to access these tools. These tools are inbuilt. They'll follow you from education into the workplace and you need to encourage people around you to use them. I use the um, narration, so the, the text to speech, to proofread the work that I do. Because obviously when you read something back, you'll quite often read it as you think you've written it, not necessarily as it's written. My next tip, is about creating flexible working environments. So obviously kidding out a business um, to, as a workplace, so we do workplace assessments and as a workplace assessor, something like a, a sit stand desk um, is a fairly regularly um, recommended product, but obviously they're quite expensive. Um, and kidding out uh, an entire office as standard would be a significant expense for any business. But having a small selection of, of hot desking um, sits down desks, for example, will allow you to accommodate people of tall or small stature, people with back injuries or wheelchair users. The same goes for proactive um, things like having available ergonomic mice. Um, so we've got the roller mouse here. Um, and the left and right-handed versions of upright mice. Um, and again, you're, you're talking about supporting people proactively, not saying that here's a selection of devices that can, you can use according to the way that you're going to work best, as opposed to having them come forward and have to put up their hands and say, I'm experiencing a problem. And it's also proactive in terms of things like RSIs by, by having that tech available. 
And then my final point is embracing the tech. So this to me is a really nice story uh, recently where McDonald's um, have a, a new um, option to apply for a job using your voice assistant. Um, I'm going to mute mine just in case it goes off, but the Alexa or the Google Home will allow you to go through the first round of interviews for a McDonald's job. Now, obviously not everybody has the ability to build these skills, but these voice assistants are increasingly being included in, in homes across the country. And there's no reason why we can't look to, to thinking about a future where being able to apply for a job could be done, you know, can be supported by these devices and maybe even the initial part of an interview process carried out in this, the comfort of your own home in your own time with a little recording that you can go over and over if you need to. There's no reason why we need to stick with the, the systems that we've currently got in place. So I think I'm going to um, leave it there um, because I'm going to end up wibbling in a minute. So I'm, I'm just going to stop there and hand back to Annie. Thanks, Adam, and um, thanks, Rabia, both of you, for such informative presentations. And it's it's good to see that there are, are so many easily available tools um, already out there, and to remember that such small tweaks can make such a big difference. And also, I was thinking um, just really to remind ourselves that to check our unconscious bias all the time. Um, so to move on now um, to the Q and A section. I'm, I'm sure you've all got a lot of questions you'd like to ask. Uh, so if you do have a question, please fire away in the Q&A window and we'll try to cover all your queries before the end. But if we don't, um, we will gather together unanswered questions and put a blog together at the end of, um, at the, end of the webinar uh, early next week. So um, just moving on to the questions. Um, we've got a question from Morwenna. Um, she has asked, is it legally okay to offer reasonable adjustments that aren't available to non-disabled candidates? Um, for example, giving interview questions to neurodiverse people before the interview, but not offering that to all candidates. Um, I'm not sure, Rabia, maybe you would like to start on that? Well, everybody can do a, a reasonable adjustments. Um, I'm not... I, I am not a, a legal advisor, so I can't tell you, but if that is something that would help uh, a disabled person to feel uh, less anxious and give them time to understand the question and process that question that is being asked, then that would, you know, could come under a reasonable adjustment. You can, you can um, support a, a disabled person. That's what a reasonable adjustment is there, you know, um, yeah. Okay, and I, I would say yes, but I am not a legal advisor. Okay, okay, and Adam, did, did you have anything to add? Um, all I'd add to that is, if you're thinking about reasonable adjustments, then think about what it is you're you're trying to test. Do you want to test somebody in in how quickly they can answer a question? Um, if that's not the case, then why not make that available to everybody? Why not have a a, a set time? That is that can accommodate what you would typically give as a, an adjustment, for example. So build in build in the the inclusion to your interview process, or rather than having to add it as as a an add on. Okay. Um, okay. Our next question um, is from Sally. Um, she has asked: Do those in voluntary positions have the same rights as those who are in paid positions? Um, Rabia, would you like to? Well, talk? A, re a reasonable adjustment is is uh, is for everybody, not to um, discriminate against that person. So, if they are in education or in training or in work or uh, you know in 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 their life, you know you cannot discriminate against the person. So, if you are making uh, adjustments that is inclusive for everybody, then yes. Okay. Um, Adam, do you have anything you'd like to ask? No, I'm going to stay out of that one. <laughs> okay. 
Um, just to note, um, we've had a question from David who's asked, um, is it possible to have the statistics that have been given verbally? Um, yes, we will share the, um, the slides uh, in emails that you'll all receive after the webinar. Um, and we'll, we'll include um, some further information on the blog as well. Can, can I just come back uh, for a moment with the volunteers? If you are, in, if you are as an organisation, you have volunteers, you have the same responsibility towards those volunteers to sort of, you know, to be inclusive for that volunteer. As, 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 a, as an employer, uh, you, you cannot discriminate against the volunteer, uh, whether they are paid or not. Okay. Great, thank you, Rabia. Um, we have another question from Sean. Um, she has asked, is there an accessibility checker in um, Google Docs or G Suite? Uh, perhaps Adam, you might be able to answer that. Um, there's not one that's built in, um, but there is one called Grackle, uh, which is a, a, a currently free um, add-on um, that will do similar checking but no Microsoft is the one that, that has the the inbuilt accessibility checker and at the moment Google doesn't have anything inbuilt and another question that we've had um, separately is um, do you have any specific tips for neurodiverse people um, Rabia perhaps you'd be able to answer that well um, it's, it's first of all also to provide an environment where the person feels comfortable in you know maybe a quiet place that you could provide for that person um, if you are prior to a person coming to work and you will say, oh, you know, this, in, this, uh, your job, uh, it involves using a, a photocopier, you know, not just sort of like to show a picture of a photocopier, use the photocopier, go out and take a picture of the photocopier in the workplace. Um, and to define clear plans and time outcomes, uh, that is expected of the individual to check for understanding as well. Um, and uh, to allow sufficient time to listen to a person and to allow a person to finish a task. That would be some uh, tips, I would say. Those are, those are, that's really good advice. Um, we've also had um, a question through, um, just looking through the chat panel. Um, do you have any um, examples of organisations that have, um, or uh, universities that have organised meaningful encounters with um, employers for disabled students? Um, Adam, I know you've had a lot of experience. Perhaps, do you have any examples? That you can um, I'm really, really bad at thinking of things on, on my feet. <laughs> um, and if it's not tech base we, we have had um, there are several people out there and I can certainly add it to the blog because we did see somebody recently who was working very closely I just can't remember the name but there, there are um, people who work very closely with institutions about um, getting people getting disabled people into work directly from there from university okay great yeah we'll add that to the blog um, Rabia uh, and I, I'll, again, I'm going to say I do know of a few, but not on the top of my head right now. So I, I can I can add to that. But uh, um, I think uh, university in, in Norwich, there is a university, University of Greenwich, perhaps. Um, uh, Kenzin, uh, yes, there is. Uh, I have we have um, a YouTube video where you you can see a, a young young man called Joe who found a job uh, an apprenticeship and that was through uh, that was a further education college actually you know to find that job and the way that they worked so uh, i can send that link that would be great yeah and we'll send that round to everybody um okay we've got one more question which is um mostly i think directed towards adam's part of the presentation um just thinking about apps, uh, do you have any particular apps that might help um, in particular with reading or spelling? Um, reading and spelling, obviously the, there are the, um, the learning, uh, yeah, the learning um, suite, the, the immersive reader within um, Microsoft uh, is a fantastic product, um, not just to help with reading, but again, it's about something that helps everybody um so not just if you're struggling with reading but if you're i don't know if you're you're sitting on a sitting by a window and you've got 
bright screen and you're struggling to to look at the the text in front of you yeah the immersive reader is fantastic um i'd also say with with spelling then use the voice assistants um i quite regularly do say alexa how do you spell such and such and and um get it you know read back to me so use the tech around you don't just assume that, that something is there to switch on your lights or play music think about the ways in which you can use the the, the way in which they work to to help you with with whatever you're doing so yeah if you're filling out a job application or you want a hand with it with spelling then do say alexa google siri whatever how do you spell such and such Okay, and just very quickly before um, before I wrap up the webinar, um, this is a very quick question from Catherine. Um, she has asked, uh, which version of MS Office are the tools available in? Um, 3.6.5. So uh, they, they were available on earlier versions as an add-in, but uh, Office 3.6.5 and, and online. Uh, so, for example, it, it's available for free in, in OneNote, and OneNote's a free product anyway. Um, but, it's, yeah, Office 3.6.5, the latest version. Okay, fantastic. Well, just looking at the time, I think we're going to end the webinar there. Um, just to say, as per the slides that are on screen, um, when we do end the webinar, there's a feedback form that comes up. So um, we do encourage you to let us know any feedback about the webinar and any comments you have about future topics that you'd like us to cover. Um, slides and transcripts and recording will, will be available very soon, so you'll receive them soon. Um, Again, if you have a question that hasn't been covered, do feel free to send it through to us. Um, uh, Adam, if you'd just be able to um, go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, just to say, we hope we, we'll meet some of you at uh, AbilityNet's TechShare Pro Conference, which is coming up on the 20th and 21st of November. You can find out more about it at www.techsharepro.com. And if you'd like to join us for our next webinar, it's on Thursday, the 28th of November at one o'clock, um, looking at the UK public sector bodies, digital accessibility regulations. Um, we'll be joined by the University of York as a case study. Uh, again, if you'd like to find out about our webinars and other news, um, do register for our newsletter at abilitynet.org.uk if you haven't already. And just to say thank you once again to Ravia and Adam and everybody who's joined us and um, your time this lunch time um, and we'll be in touch very soon bye everybody bye thank you bye thanks a lot thank you bye